I believe that one of the prime reasons that people are so helpless politically is a fundamental lack of ideological awareness. If you are unaware of the underlying justifications for the actions our leaders, both political and entrepreneurial, take, then it is impossible to understand fully and predict the effect those decisions will have on your day-to-day -day life. This is pure ideology. A series dedicated to explaining the underlying ideological current for our society today. During the current COVID-19 crisis, it is really no surprise that a lot of the public attention has turned to healthcare. Healthcare supplies have dominated the news, healthcare workers have been lauded as heroes and the front line in this war against the crisis. And despite this, governments that currently have socialized healthcare are systemically breaking down and eroding the very healthcare systems preventing health-related bankruptcy and medical extortion. In 2018, the province of Ontario held their 42nd provincial election. As June 7th closed, it was obvious that the electoral win would be handed over to Doug Ford. If you recognize the name, it's because this is the brother of the late and formerly disgraced Toronto Mayor Rob Ford. Now, despite his international reputation as the crack-smoking mayor of Toronto... Is this dude on crack? <laughs> Well, funny story. Rob Ford is less known for his radical pro-business and anti-regulation stance as a Toronto City Councillor. Support tax increases? I don't. You don't. You support higher um, fees and uh, implementing user fees and implementing new taxes? I don't. There's, we're two different systems. His brother is no different. In 2019, Doug Ford's cabinet received the following letter from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Dear Minister Elliott, the OCC and its members view the healthcare system as an economic driver, a $52 billion investment that has the potential to kickstart Ontario's economy. The key is removing those barriers that prevent the innovation of the procurement and delivery of care. In short, your ministry must make healthcare open for business. In other words, the Chamber of Commerce was requesting that the Ford government dismantle the public health system of Ontario, something that Ford then proceeded to do. Shortly after that letter was sent, Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horwath leaked a draft of the dismantling efforts. The unnamed bureaucrat who gave Horwath the document was then fired by the Ford administration. What was documented in the plan? The goal was to obfuscate health care cuts and reforms behind a separate opaque super agency called the Integrated Care Delivery System, or the ICDS. The current local health integration networks would be merged under this new agency in order to facilitate these cuts. Continuing the conservative penchant for health care defunding, let's head to present day Alberta. On April 9th, the AMA, Alberta Medical Association, filed a $250 million lawsuit against the Alberta government for violating its rights in contract negotiations. This follows the February 20th decision made by the UCP, United Conservative Party, to end the contract set for renewal April 1st. This would enable the governments to dictate changes to billing and compensation and deny the collective bargaining rights of Alberta's doctors. The government seeks to negotiate three-year contracts with doctors individually, all of the above has been an effort to pull private enterprise in and cut funding to the public health care system. In the case of budget cuts, this paves the way for people to make an argument against public ownership on the grounds of its inefficacy, as we have seen the same regarding automotive insurance in my home province of British Columbia, even going so far as to call public utility ownership monopolistic. Once again, when we look at these events, I think it is important to dive a little deeper, ideologically speaking. On April 14th, the article titled, In an Age of Pandemics, We Need More Freedom to Trade, Not Less, was published to the Mises Institute that outlined this particular economist's distaste with the autarky that was leading to the closure of borders and halting of trade. That it was entirely the fault of governments that reacted late and in a destructive manner, claiming that Italy's late response to the crisis is the fault of its state-run healthcare system. He further went to contrast it with South Korea, stating, Whereas the South Korean healthcare system, one of the more free market oriented ones in the world, has been one of the most successful in dealing with the virus because of its flexibility. Reality, however, is in disagreement with Dr. Toth. There were three claims here, the first two being that Italy's healthcare is state run and performed poorly in reaction to the emergency. The third, that South Korea's healthcare system is one of the more market oriented ones in the world. Let's start at the first two. Italy's healthcare is a mixed public-private system where about 77% of the $3,200 per capita GDP was spent in the public sector, aka state-run. According to the World Health Organization, Italy's healthcare system is ranked second in the world, next to France with an average life expectancy of 82.3 years, over two years above average. The reason Italy has been hit so hard with the COVID-19 crisis is not an example of state-run healthcare systems performing poorly. The reason Italy is facing this crisis is because of it not taking the crisis seriously, and to make sure the economy did not panic and stop because of the virus. Italy's failure to address the crisis was in fact because they wanted to do nothing and avoid closing business and put a halt on economic growth. 
Now let's turn to South Korea. Looking closer at South Korea's healthcare system is probably one of the most telling ways to prove Dr. Toth has no idea what he was talking about. South Korea has a single-payer government-managed healthcare system funded by government spending, tobacco surcharges, and contributions. What the good doctor is likely referencing is the fact that 77% of all South Koreans have a form of private insurance because their National Health Insurance Corporation only covers 60% of their healthcare costs. The reason South Korea was able to get ahead of the virus was not because of its 40% free market. To quote South Korean Foreign Minister Ken Kyung-hwa, in mid-January, our health authorities quickly conferred with the research institutions here to develop a test, and then they shared that result with the pharmaceutical companies, who then produced the reagent chemical and the equipment needed for the testing. It was the government intervention in the market that dealt with it. Had they relied upon market signals to deal with the crisis, they would have failed. This is evident in the American response to the virus. Market signals, an action taken by a consumer or business that indirectly hints towards a demand are by their nature reactive. They happen after demand is created. In order to build demand for a testing kit, people need to already be sick. Without a governing body to preemptively create demand, markets would have lagged behind the virus, like they are in the United States. South Korea was able to handle the virus precisely because it had a government-run healthcare system. The more draconian measures that we are seeing in Western countries are the result of economic interest and government hesitance to dictate anything, even things that will benefit the public to private enterprise. Where is the ideological root of this man's faulty, unfounded article, though? Once again, we circle back to neoliberalism. The Mises Institute is an economic foundation that seeks to, and I quote, promote teaching and research in the Austrian school of economics and individual freedom. Honest history and international peace is the tradition of Ludwig von Mises. Who is Ludwig von Mises? Well, he is the mentor of one Friedrich Hayek, who in turn played a seminal role in Milton Friedman's neoliberal experiments in South America and now the rest of the world, essentially the great grandfather of neoliberalism. Once again, they are arguing that markets are the most efficient method of distributing the wealth of society, and that markets should be allowed to trade unimportant and without restrictions. The real miracle is not that those uh, economic arrangements worked so well, because that's what Adam Smith said. The real miracle is that a military hunter was willing to let him do it. In reality, however, they only proved themselves to be effective at enriching already rich shareholders and privately owned enterprises. 